I recently caught up with Dr. Rick Carbone of UC Davis, who has a paper in the journal on the long-term demographic consequences of eavesdropping in sagebrush. What problem in ecology was your study trying to solve? Well, we now have evidence for about 10, 12 different plant systems of volatile communication between plants so that when a plant's neighbor gets damaged, that focal plant becomes more resistant to its herbivores. It, it, it suffers less natural herbivory. Um, this has been very controversial over the last few decades. And as evidence, uh, as we collect examples that uh, appear uh, to be cases of, of this phenomenon, it's unclear but interesting to know whether or not this is just the consequence of some other process or whether or not this has at least the potential to be an adaptation that's been shaped by the plant's response to herbivory. And in order to, to figure that out, we need to know what the reproductive consequences, the fitness consequences are for plants that are able to eavesdrop on cues of their neighbors versus plants that are not eavesdropping on the cues of their neighbors. So in brief, could you explain what, what was your main finding or, or findings if you had many of them? Sure. I followed a cohort of plants um, that uh, germinated in 1999 and I followed them for about 12 years and uh, for half of those plants for five years, from 2004 to 2008, I uh, experimentally damaged their neighbors. And then I just followed their um, survival, growth, and reproduction for this 12-year period um, and, and compared um, how well these plants did with neighbors that had either been experimentally damaged and were emitting volatile cues that we knew were um, reducing levels of herbivory, um, did that translate into differences in how well the plants did? And what we found was that um, plants that had these damaged neighbors um, produced more branches produced more inflorescences. We failed to detect any differences in how well they survived. And, and then we also, um, we also followed a cohort of seedlings, uh, I think about 5,000 seedlings. And most of those did not survive, but those that were uh, germinated near an adult that we experimentally uh, clipped were more likely to survive through their first um, through their first dry season and then seedlings that were near adults that were not experimentally clipped. So both of these um, both of these results suggest that there may be some slight fitness advantage uh, for plants that respond to um, cues uh, that their neighbors are releasing when those neighbors get damaged. Even though in this case, then the, the cues may really be um, not particularly honest cues because we experimentally clipped the neighbors, got them to release these volatiles that are normally associated with high levels of herbivory. But in this case, there were not these really high levels of herbivory so that the cues may have almost been a little bit of misinformation for the responding plants. Nonetheless, those plants that um, had neighbors giving off these cues had, had slightly enhanced fitness relative to um, those sagebrush plants that didn't have these neighbors. Do you think you would see different effects in, in, in different ecosystems because we're, we're sort of dealing with um, volatile chemicals that might respond to sort of the abiotic conditions? Uh, that seems like a, a reasonable hypothesis. Um, it turns out that a lot of plants are incapable or don't use 
vascular communication, communication from one branch to the next. And this has been, um, th this is well known, especially for desert shrubs. Um, it might be that vascular communication requires active transpiration, which these plants um, are not going to be capable of uh, during large portions of the year. And so it may be that for plants growing in, uh, for shrubs and for plants growing in, in um, dry conditions, that vascular communication is not a viable option much of the time. And so they may be more reliant on volatile communication than are other plants that are actively growing or growing in places where uh, transpiration is less of a problem. In terms of the applied consequences, uh, if there are if there are any, um, I was curious if 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 you know farmers could actually put this into practice by um, using some of the, the chemicals that are used for communication and, and reducing herbivory. That's certainly our, a long term goal. Um, we're uh, almost certainly far from achieving that goal, but it seems like we need two new pieces of information. One is we need to know what some of these signals are. And um, we, we have a few of these. Um, various jasminates are very uh, potent uh, elicitors of, and, and, and signals of um, resistance, plant resistance against their herbivores. And these signals seem to be highly conserved so that um, uh, almost all plants seem to use the same, at least some of the same signals. Um, if, we, if we have some of these, these signals of, of these natural products um, and we understand a little bit more about how plants use them and the fitness consequences, the, the, the yield consequences of inducing resistance, then it, it seems um, at least conceivable that um, in the future, and is this the near future, 10 years from now, it, it, it's hard to know, um, that we may be able to use some of these elicitors to manipulate levels of natural host plant resistance in our crop systems. And, and that certainly is something that um, we'd be interested in pursuing. How general do you think these results are, uh, and, and in what cases would you expect um, the same or different patterns? I, I really don't know. So one of the things that uh, I hope to do very soon is to, um, to do similar experiments, and I know that there are other people who are doing similar experiments, uh, looking at a wide variety of species. And hopefully, um, very soon, we're going to be able to make some generalizations. We just don't have enough examples at this point. We, we haven't tried this in, in enough, on enough plant species and different environmental situations. We just don't know. But I think that's going to happen pretty soon. If I had to speculate, um, I would guess that perhaps... Uh, volatile communication is going to be more prominent in dry environments because of the constraints on vascular communication that we talked about a few minutes ago. Uh, so, so coming back to your, your paper specifically, what do you think are the consequences um, for the field of, of your, your paper? Well, I think it's exciting that there's at least some evidence that uh, plants can experience fitness benefits by responding to cues and cues that are not even particularly accurate. These, these cues are being artificially generated. So as I mentioned, in a sense, they're providing misinformation for plants that are responding to them. The cues are usually associated with high levels of natural herbivory. In, in this case, there aren't high levels of natural herbivory. Um, even with that level of misinformation, plants that respond experienced reduced herbivory and increases in branching, flower production, survival of seedlings. 
And um, I think it's exciting that even under those conditions, there is a measurable um, increase in at least some components of fitness, um, which suggests that um, these may be traits that um, are the result of um, adaptations, uh, and, and adaptations in particular to, um, to herbivory. So, so coming back to the, the field of, of sort of the volatile communication and herbivory, where would you, where would you um, like the field to be in 10 years, or, or where, where do you see it being in 10 years? I think that um, in 10 years, I, I would imagine that we will have um, a much clearer sense of what the actual chemical cues are, and um, that we'll have a better sense of how these work in the plant, um, maybe um, how plants perceive these cues, how they respond to them, and much more about um, how this plays out in terms of plant fitness. What, what are the consequences? And, and with those pieces of information, I think we'd be in a much stronger position to use elicitors of resistance um, to manipulate uh, resistance levels in crop plants and in other species that, that we care about. So uh, we like to ask our interviewees if they have any uh, interesting stories from the field or lab. Oh, uh, not, not really. I, I guess um, one of the things that um, has been a, a, a message to me about uh, working in this field um, is, is more of a sociological message. I think that um, there were early reports in the, um, uh, around 1980 of communication between trees and um, these uh, got labeled as talking trees. Um, the experiments um, had problems as do all experiments. Um, and I think that uh, the field as a whole evaluated um, these experiments um, and uh, decided that um, they'd been debunked and therefore that the phenomenon of, of volatile communication between plants wasn't occurring. And that uh, made um, acceptance of this work um, far more difficult um, it was as if we had already decided that we'd considered this phenomenon, couldn't find evidence for it, debunked it, and um, it didn't occur. And, and, and so um, gaining acceptance um, of this work has been a lot more difficult based on this uh, sort of sociological history. And, and that has been pretty challenging. Um, working in this field. Well, thanks so much for doing this. Yeah, thank you. Bye. <laughs>